because when you have two things and one thing is more beautiful, you're going to go towards Inshallah, what is more beautiful. So we don't have Inshallah. to talk about these ridiculous, vacuous, meaningless, dunya oriented, egocentric, ego egotistical folk. It's obvious, anyone with any social awareness, <laughs> that these people have internal pathologies. Um, and no one with a decent sense of godliness is going to take them seriously anyway. And if they do, we're going to present the beauty of Islam. So, and once you show the beauty of Islam, people are going to be attracted to it. So Allah mentions the quality of men. No trade, no commerce, no worldly gain diverts them from what? From the remembrance of Allah. Us as a collective, we don't focus on the very essential internal elements of what it means to be a man. Or even a Muslim which includes battling one's ego. They speak volumes to what it means to be a man and they actually start with or they include the word min rijal or ar rijal Yes. Men are. The highlight is men. Mm -hmm. And I want to worship him in the best way possible which includes internal and external manifestations of worship which would include in this context asking a key question what does Allah want from me in this context? What is more pleasing to Allah in this context? Wallahu yuhibbul mutatahireen Because in it are men who love to be purified and God loves those who are purified. In it are men who what? love to be purified, not just purification for wudu and then entering into the formal canonical prayer. Absolutely, that is purification. But purifying their hearts of everything other than Allah and displeasing Allah and the ego getting the better of it and the whims and desires overcoming it uh, such that we end up doing haram. That is the mark of a man and it's not me that's saying it, it is the book of Allah. This is... Um quite moving. It's as if I've never heard this verse before. That yes, uh, your, your financial means and if you have a flashy car and if you have a really expensive watch and if you can smoke a cigar and drink the best brandy, you know, m you know a thousand pound bottle of brandy, then you know, you, you, people will look at you with worth. Maybe they will, but those people who will do that are people that are irrelevant to God. You see that, what is Allah trying to say to us here? The dog happened to be with the pious people and Allah saved the people in the cave and saved the dog. So Ibn Kithu says, if Allah will save a dog because it happens to be righteous people, what would Allah do to your life? Allah Akbar. So the lady Khadija has unwittingly been butchered by us Muslims in the modern era. And the lady Aisha radiallahu anha, I, uh, 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 I contend, has also been butchered by us Muslims unintentionally. You know why? Because we have degree. we have uh, adopted neoliberal and sometimes postmodern epistemological and metaphysical assumptions willingly and unwillingly. We've jumped into the epistemological and metaphysical lizard hole thinking it's the cave of Hira. Ar Rijal, of course it's gonna have the word Rijal. Ar Rijal قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ Allahu Akbar, okay. absolutely. بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْدُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْدٍ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Men are قَوَّمُون over women. Men are, uh, are protectors of women by virtue of what strength Allah has given the one over the other and because of what they spend of their wealth to maintain them. Yes. And I just want to make it very clear that if you find this problematic or it's not in line with your liberal or postmodern sensitivities, then you have the problem, not us. And you know this whole idea of that Islam has to now align itself with these liberal, or secular, or postmodern tendencies is a false narrative. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Chef Abu Alia from the Jawzia Institute <laughs> with a forthcoming book called Muslimness and Modernity. Allah bless you. Allah bless you. So. I love you for the sake of Allah. And my nafs loves you as well. Okay? So you have double love from me. May he you have who, a special place in my heart. Jazakallah for coming. Barakallah fikum. May he who's, uh, for whose sake you love me, love you also. Ameen. Ameen. So we had a call, I think, a few weeks ago. I'm not going to go into the nature of that call. But it was with regards to a potential problem that's existing in the social space, especially online space, concerning masculinity. And this is who I am, or I try to be like this. I was like, let's be, let's be the solution. So that's why we're here today, right? Inshallah. So 
we may agree with many things, we may disagree, but we're going to have an authentic conversation of what authenticity means, as you know, is we don't have any undeclared negative intentions, right? So if we say there is a masculinity crisis, well, what is masculinity? Absolutely. Especially from the Islamic paradigm. Let's try to be as objective as possible, but there's going to be some level of subjectivity there, but hopefully we can sort the wheat from the chaff or the audience can sort the wheat from the chaff. Um, if we're going to look at masculinity, the first question to ask is, has Revelation itself spoken about gender issues and in particular, in particular masculinity or femininity for that matter? Sure. And the answer is it has. Um, we as a, uh, as a religious tradition uh, that goes back to a scripture, uh, we believe and we celebrate in fact uh, a gendered world, a gendered cosmos. We believe Allah has in his divine wisdom uh, created things uh, quite often in pairs, uh, male and female. وَلَيْسَ ذَكْرُكَ الْأُنْثَى the Qur'an says, and the man is not like the woman. Mm. Okay, which is telling us there are, there, is, there are men, there are women. There are males, there are females, there, are ma there is masculinity, there is femininity. And I know that will, that kind of goes against the liberal orthodoxies of our times. Who cares? Uh, which, yeah, but Frankly, that's, not, the, that's really not our concern. And it's not, not really our uh, business whether they're going to be pleased with it or not. Yeah. Uh, but for <laughs> us, yeah, exactly. for us, uh, we, we know that actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken, spoken of an engendered world or universe. Which is, by the way, in line with um, cognitive science, psycho psychological studies, there are key differences when and I just, did and just by and just by basic biology absolutely when I did individual differences in a module as a module when I did psychology years ago at university this is before I started my philosophy academic journey we had a module called individual differences which actually highlighted the individual differences concerning what it means to be a male and a female absolutely uh, absolutely and um uh, social engineering and social construction uh, always I is a challenge, especially for governmental policy. I mean, for example, our government for quite a while now have been trying to up the quotas of females going into IT. Mm. And they're finding, you know, we're offering them all of these advantages and, and perks, but we seem not, we don't seem to be getting women in IT. Yeah, for sure. Um, it seems to be dominated by men. Uh, perhaps they should be thinking why rather than just trying to uh, reconstruct the, the social order. But hey, yeah. So you're that, saying that by the side. so you're saying that Allah has created a gendered yeah, world. Yeah, and it's something we should celebrate. Yes, uh, we celebrate that the fact that there is femininity. We celebrate the fact that there is masculinity. We now have to ask the question: What is masculinity? What does it mean uh, to be a man? Hmm. I mean, it could be said in a number of ways. What does it mean to be a man? Yeah. But what does it mean to be a man sure. in Islam? Has Allah said anything in the Quran that might help us to understand, since now he has created men and women, is there a kind of blueprint, we might say, that Allah expects men to have certain qualities and women to have certain qualities distinct from each other and also shared qualities mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's just the human family. Has Allah mentioned anything like that? Well, he has. Um, in the Quran itself, there are verses, and I, I, we won't go, I don't want to go into many verses, but I, will, I want to pick on four verses okay. that I believe, um, I mean, they speak volumes to what it means to be a man, and they actually start with, or they include the word min rijal or ar rijal Yes. Men are. The highlight is men, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Muslim men. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and let's, let's go through uh, some of these verses and we kind of explore them together. So in Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd chapter, uh, verse 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Min al-mu'mineen rijalun. So mm. this word, rajul rijal. Min al-mu'mineen rijalun sadhu ma ahadullaha alayh. And from of the believers are men who fulfill what they promised Allah. It can be read in the past as well, who fulfilled what they promised Allah. So of the believers are rijal, men. Mm. And what are their description? The promise that they made with Allah of la ilaha illallah, oh. and all that la ilaha illallah necessitates at least at the obligatory level. Yes. 
they are those who have fulfilled it. When they have fallen short in any action, tawba, repentance, sincere contrition, is part of their is part of their way as well, which is part of the ahad, the promise of uh, uh, that we make with Allah that ya Allah, if we fall short, we will turn back to you in repentance, and you are the forgiver. So, this description, one of a number, tells us Muslim men are what those who fulfil their promises with God. Yes. So a Muslim man, just from this verse so far is judged on the criteria that the more that he fulfills his promise that he's made with God that oh God I will be your servant your worshipper I, I will recognize you as my Lord and uh, um, my divine the God that I worship God that I worship and I worship none but you inwardly and outwardly the more a man fulfills that the more a man is from the Rijal in the Qur'an and conversely, yes. the less he fulfills it, then he may be outwardly a man, but inwardly he's not a Rijal, he's not a man. Perfect. So, so in essence, this is the affirmation of Allah's oneness, the fact that he's worthy of worship. We should love him the most. We should obey him. We should know him. We should single out and direct all acts of worship to Allah alone, the internal acts of worship and the external acts of worship. And the internal also includes love and so on and so forth. And it would also include, therefore, that you do not take your hawa, your desires, as your Lord, right? As Allah says in the Quran, right? Having, seen, having you not seen those who take the desires as their Lord. And it also means that your ego is diminished to a certain degree. Because obviously you cannot, ha you can't be, e you can't be totally egoless. You can't be totally ego-free, but you have a lowered, lowered ego, and you're humbled before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, which is extremely important. Because sometimes we think, you know, a sense of humility is actually not a, a manly trait, but actually it's a, it's a very manly trait, especially when it comes to the relation between you and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And it's manly because we find the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi speaking so about its virtues we find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi having that virtue, extolling that virtue and making it central to his very being of who he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was essentially yes. was so we know that not because you and I feel that it should be a good thing because revelation insists that it is Absolutely. and that is the key here our definitions of manliness can't be what you said uh, upon a whim that we decide randomly uh, otherwise subhanallah we're at a stage where society doesn't really want man or woman it you know it wants to be taken us somewhere else but no the Quran is saying that actually here are here is men and here are some of the qualities in this particular one verse is that they are true to their promise with God and you're saying here there is the uh, external manifestation of that and the internal manifestation. Indeed, uh, I, and I don't want to get into it right now, but it is important to know that when we make a promise with Allah of La ilaha illallah, then as you quite rightly said, it's, it's not just about outward acts of worship because ibadah or worship in Islam has the concept of khudu, up, utmost humility to God, and mahabba, love. Love, yes. Okay, without, uh, without uh, love, and humility to God, there is no such thing as worship. Yes. Okay. But this is very important because when we talk about from a practical perspective and we're engaging with online and, and offline work, if you are true to your promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, therefore you will have an Allah-centric mindset and an Akhirah-centric mindset. And you would ask the question when you're engaging with yourself and other people, what does Allah want from me in this context and situation? What is more pleasing to Allah? How do I worship Allah to the best of my ability in this particular context? The reason I'm mentioning this is a bit of a hidden agenda is because sometimes the way we interact with each other as believers and even the way we, we interact with those who deny the truth, we do it in a way that's more in line with our nafs, our egocentric or egotistical um, drives, rather than uh, stepping back and saying, okay, I want to fulfill my trust, my amana with Allah, 
and I want to worship him in the best way possible, which includes internal and external manifestations of worship, which would include in this context asking a key question, what does Allah want from me in this context? What is more pleasing to Allah in this context? I am so surprised that it's, it's seemingly the case that we do not ask the question to our own nafs concerning the way we interact with each other. Just step back, brothers and sisters, and ask, what does Allah want from me in this particular context? What is more pleasing to Him? And that for me is a key question that is in line with keeping to your amana, your trust with Allah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, my difficulty here is not in concepts. I think the concepts are, are clear. My, uh, I'm just a bit restrained in um, I'm trying to avoid generalizing uh, the problem amongst Muslims. Yeah, for, sure. for example, m m my son uh, is, uh, is, I think he's about 28 years old now. Uh, and um, he, you know, he has friends, uh, uh, many of them are practicing because he's a, a student of, of, of knowledge and um, studying with his teachers and whatever. And so he has those kind of friends. But he also has just other friends as well, Muslim and non-Muslim. And over the years, like I, uh, since he was 18, I kind of made a mental note that, mashallah, I find, and let's just stick with his Muslim friends, I find that generally his Muslim friends are not just very polite and civil and respectful, uh, but they are, mashallah, uh, sometimes when I'm around long enough to just observe them, I find that they have such beautiful makings of young men. Mashallah. Uh, so I know in my interaction, and this is just a small slither of it with my, my son's friends, but there are other young men that come to me or that I interact with, uh, that we're not talking about that they're, oh, they're polite. We're talking about they seem to want to be, want to uh, desire to be a man in the God-pleasing sense of the word. There are other Muslims that I have met that seem to be exactly what you're saying. They, for them, that question never comes up. It's just all about me, 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 me. Because me. they conflate masculinity in Islamic sense with mm. macho-ness. Yes, absolutely. And those are two different things. And there's a cultural paradigm as yeah, well. Because and there's an egotistical paradigm as well. And we have to include, and we'll discuss this in a few moments, we're not saying that you shouldn't be brave and assertive and strong. No, we'll, we'll cover that. But bravery is not always reacting to things. Bravery is being very surgical with so, your bravery. So, so, and we'll so discuss what that means later. But yeah. So that's the first verse. So I just want to summarize what you're saying. We need to have the internal and external um, manifestations of Tawheed, of affirming Allah's oneness, that we love Him, we want to know Him. We, we are an abid, we're, we're a servant to Allah. And the more we're in line with that internally and externally, the more of a man we are. Right. Is and that correct summary of what you're yes. saying? Yes. Good. And this verse, in context, the verse was actually in context of, of, of jihad, of, of, of waging war against the enemies of God. And they, uh, the verses before tell us how there, there were men who sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice. But even before they sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice, they died martyrs. They were living a life of godliness. So they had right. sacrificed their desires for the pleasure of their Lord. So they were already in that high level, but then they gave their ultimate sacrifice. Uh, of the believers are, are men. That's the point. The verse mentions men. Yes. And they descri described as those who fulfill their promise with Allah. An another verse. Rijalun. Quran. Rijalun. Men, okay, who neither, uh, so it starts with in houses where Allah is remembered, that's the verse just before, wherein there is men whom neither trade nor selling diverts from the remembrance of Allah. So Allah mentions the quality of men. No trade, no commerce, no worldly gain diverts them from what? From the remembrance of Allah, وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ Nor from establishing the prayer or giving the zakat. يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَقَلَّبُوا فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ And they fear a day in which hearts and sights will be overturned. Mm. They fear accountability with God. So here Rijal are described, men are described with certain qualities. 
The first thing is, they live in this world, they are part of this world, but they are not distracted uh, by the world in their journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they don't have hubba dunya they don't have the love of the dunya. And if they and if they if they do have it to some degree, they try not to make it eclipse their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oh. by doing something haram. And then it becomes part of their journey and trying to not have hubbud dunya, love of this world and just live in the world. Which is very different than when we're being told uh, by I mean this was a non Muslim, uh, uh, this was a red pill insult kind of uh, talk that yes uh, your your financial means and if you have a flashy car and if you have a really expensive watch and if you can smoke a cigar and drink the best brandy you know m you know a thousand pound bottle of brandy then you know you, you people will look at you with worth maybe they will but those people who will do that are people that are irrelevant to God. Yeah, yeah of course. Right? I mean, so I mean, well, it's irrelevant to us. Just to be very clear, this whole red pill nonsense is just uh, meaningless, vacuous, it's e egotistical, it's kufr. A lot of it is kufr. The only pill uh, we need is a green pill. And, and not just that, what it is, is a lot of the stuff that they say is just a... a, a, it's a it's, it's a. It shows that just, it's just a veil for internal pathology that they have. Yeah, yeah they, of, they've of had some trauma or pathologies. Yeah. yeah, I mean, let's not talk about them because I don't think they should be taken seriously. So, because I'm a true believer that sometimes it's important to provide what God Allah has said, what the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said, and if we articulate in the right way, like you're doing, mashallah tabarakallah, people will just. Uh, adopt it because when you have two things and one thing is more beautiful you're going to go towards Inshallah, what is more beautiful so we don't have Inshallah. to talk about these ridiculous vacuous meaningless dunya orientated egocentric ego egotistical folk it's obvious anyone with any social awareness <laughs> that these people have internal pathologies um, and no one with a decent sense of godliness is going to take them seriously anyway and if they do we're going to present the beauty of Islam so, and once you show the beauty of Islam people are going to be attracted to it so carry on so, yeah, so you're so, saying no but that point yeah, that, sorry, that yeah point, of course you're right it's not that um, it's not that young Muslim and let's focus on young Muslim men even though this um, all, a lot of this can apply to uh, Muslim women as well yes. and it, not necessarily young it can apply to all of us but let's focus on young Muslim men who seem to be uh, their voices seem to be those voices that apparently we're not hearing enough and there and I believe there's there's a truth in that and there is an anger from some of their voice and they have some justification of that anger but perhaps they don't have justification of you know being aggressive to others if they are that mm. um, but and there are a few people who are well known in the Tao I, I can think of one or two who because they're not formal scholars or formal students of scholars and sat down long enough with the ulama um, it's more of what do I think Islam is from my own thinking and research and currently we're beginning to see the voice of the gospel of prosperity that kind of uh, that old Christian Protestant thing that you could never imagine would come into Islam there are people who, and I'm sure they're well intended but misguided who are saying that actually richness okay that is part of being a Muslim man a Muslim man isn't expected to be poor and dress in rags whilst that latter part is true okay that's not a requirement it's also not a requirement to be rich with in, in the material yeah, sure. sense of the world it's whatever we I mean, are that is a can of worms would op open another day because so there is a I, lot to I that. I just yeah? want I want us to bear that in mind because sure. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in this ver ver verse, "Rijalun la tulhihim tijara wa la They are they are men who neither wealth nor trade nor sale diverts from the remembrance of Allah. So the heart is attached to Allah and His remembrance, and whilst living in this world they are not diverted from their connection to God. The less we are di diverted inwardly and outwardly from our, our attachment and our remembrance and our recollection and our worship of Allah, the more we can be said to be Rijal. Good. So the dunya, the worldliness, making money, prosperity, acquiring wealth and objects and things like that, right? That should be in your heart, it shouldn't be in your heart. So it should be in your hand, not in your heart. Okay? Absolutely. And if you're doing it, it should be done from the perspective of it being Allah centric and Akhirah centric. Because 
for me, a Muslim man or Muslim in general must have a vision for their life, must have a global vision, and that vision has to be in line with the criteria of success, and the criteria of success in the Quran is what the greatest triumph is going to Jannah, right? Being enveloped by the pleasure and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the special mercy and love of Allah, and your internal bliss in paradise. That is the great, greatest triumph, as Allah says. So we know what success is, right, in the grand global cosmic scheme of things. And we need to have a vision that's in line with, with, with that understanding of success. And therefore, when you, and you should strive to accumulate wealth and so on and so forth, to take care of your family, your family members, your immediate family, your community, and as many people as possible for sure. But it has to be done in line with the criteria of success and in line with your vision of the world and your, your own personal vision. Absolutely. Like look at Suleiman alayhi salam when he, he asked Allah for forgiveness, right? So he's uh, akhirah centric. He wants to be enveloped in Allah's special mercy. But then he said, grant me a kingdom that no one else has basically had before. So we see here, he, he, it was Allah centric, akhirah centric, you know, that he wants to achieve paradise. And he wanted something from the dunya, but as we know in his life, he was a righteous king and this kingdom was going to be in line with the criteria of success. It's interesting because... Is, is, is that clear? No, yeah. It's clear and it, it's interesting that you, you bring that up, that um, Suleiman salam was a uh, prophet king or a messenger yes. king. Because when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is given that, uh, he is offered the choice that the angel Gabriel says to him that Allah has told me to ask you, do you wish to be a, a, a messenger king or a slave prophet? Okay, oh. either in the form of you know having uh, you know having dominion, okay, so, like Sulaiman alayhi salam and Dawood alayhi salam's uh, father and son, or a slave messenger. The yes. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, I choose to be a slave mes messenger, but I ask Allah that. One day let him feed me, and one day let me go hungry. One day let him feed me, one Small. day let him let me go hungry. And that was the same occasion, the occasion of the Isra and the Miraj, where he's offered wine or milk. The Prophet uh, the, um, yeah, wine or milk. And the Prophet chooses the milk, and Jibreel alayhi salam says, Huditu lil fitra, you have been guided to the innate naturalness of that Allah is pleased with. Okay. Um, so point the point being is he'd be a slave messenger. There'll be humility in his life. It's not really about dominion. And even though dominion and political authority and strength is within the teachings of Islam. But the Prophet وسلم, early on in Makkah, when he is offered, because the Quraysh have got fed up with you know, his preaching and he's making more and more converts, still not many, but more and more converts, and they realize they can't stop this new nascent teaching or religion, so they, they're trying to make, offer him the, 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 the kind of frustrated compromise. Look, if it's wealth you're after, we'll pull our resources together and give you all the wealth. Uh, if it's um, dominion, political authority you want over us, we'll make you our king and we won't take a decision without running it past you first. And if it be that you know you want to marry the women, we will get all our best females together and give it to you. And the process says, I don't want any of that. Sure. And the reason why is because not that any of those things aren't important, it's that he wants people to understand he's not calling to a political ideology, but to a metaphysical spiritual message. Yes. Um, Which would also have implications in the world as it well. Will. Yes. Uh, it, it will have political in yes. uh, implications. Politics is part of Islam. There's no, no doubt about that. Siyas yeah. is from Islam. Um, no one really would uh, deny that. But the point being is the essence of what it means to be a human being, a worshipper of Allah, is predicated on certain qualities. Some of these qualities are mentioned in the Rijal verses. This is very interesting because it goes to show as well that there are levels here. So sometimes when you think about, you know, what does it mean to be a, a man in the Islamic tradition, sometimes we automatically think having a dominion and having wealth is a good thing. And it is. It's not blameworthy per se, as long as it's Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric. No problem. But look at the life of the Prophet wasallam. He was so focused in his vision, so focused in pleasing Allah, that those things were almost secondary. Do you see my point? Like he had a very deeply meaningful existence that all his kind of internal and external resources were aligned 
to being the best possible human being, which was the case, and pleasing Allah the most, which was the case. Yeah. And therefore, the dominion aspect and the aspect of trying to, you know, you know, the bling bling, right, was secondary. When you have non-prophets, like, like Abu Bakr, who we believe reached the maqam al-mashahada, mm. spiritually witnessing God with the heart, with the Ayn al-Basira. And generally their state, generally their state was that the constant remembrance and the constant awareness of Allah's presence in their life, it wasn't, oh, at mosque time, at prayer time in Ramadan, when I'm picking up the Quran, it was just consistent. So we call that uh, mushahada, spiritual witnessing, because the heart sees Allah. When that's the case of a non-prophet, what would be the maqam, the state of a prophet, let alone the best of prophets, alayhim wassalatu wassalam? There isn't a word or a station. We, we don't say, oh, he was at the station of spiritually witnessing Allah, because the station of prophets are well beyond that. They're indescribable. But it gives us an idea that when he rejected these things, is because what is the comparison of all these things when the deep, immediate presence of Allah you're enveloped in that. Uh, and actually, the whole of the Islamic spiritual tradition is predicated on men and women actually drawing closer to that reality of spiritually witnessing Allah. But let me move to something simpler. So, so I want to summarize the second verse. The, yeah? the second verse, so which is in um, Surah, uh, Surah Nur. So the one that you just mentioned was. Um, that neither wealth nor trade are divert so them from the dunya is in the Allah. hand, not in the heart. Absolutely. Okay? And if you're going to have the dunya, which is not blameworthy, it's praiseworthy, but it has to be Allah-centric, Akhira-centric. Absolutely. And it doesn't divert you from the remembrance of Allah. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Absolutely. And there's no harm. Uh, this is not the high sp highest spiritual level, but just at the basic halal level, there is no harm wanting dunya, the halal things of this dunya gained in a halal way with gratitude to Allah yes. without making, at le making it be a cause of leaving any of the religious obligations or falling yes. into the clear-cut harams, then that's fine. It's just in Islam, we don't consider that to be the highest quality or even the higher quality of men. We just find it to be uh, like, it's a bit like parents. Some parents say to me, uh, I, I mean, they, you know, I remember one sister asking me, Abu Ali, is it true that in Islam, the highest love we can give their, our children is just to uh, give them uh, unconditional love? I said, no, that's probably the lowest um, level of love. We as parents need to give our children, who, however they turn out, however they are, however frustrating they are to us, we need to give our children unconditional love, period. But that is not the highest level of love. The highest level of love, we hope that we can learn to love our children for the sake of Allah because they're doing those things to please Allah that we can love them for that. That's Absolutely. the highest level of love. But the entry level of love, every one of us must love our children unconditionally. But let's not mistake the highest for the entry level. Yes. Okay. Likewise, let's not mistake that in Islam, it's allowed to um, run after material stuff, halal material yes. stuff, in the ways that I've described. Okay. It's a hierarchy of virtues. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But as men, is that what we want to do? Just barely be amongst man in a biological sense? Okay. Yeah, no, of course, for sure. Okay. So, or do do we want to aim for what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be of that kind of men who exemplify men. Well, Allah's making it clear here in this verse that the dunya shouldn't divert you away from the remembrance of Allah. So you have a criteria here now. So the, if you accumulate your domain and wealth, for example, and that deviates you away from the remembrance of Allah, then you become less of a man. Simple. Yeah. And now, if you can be in the position where you have the worldliness and the domain and the dunya and the wealth, and you increase your remembrance of Allah, or at least it doesn't make you deviate, then you have the, the manliness going on there. Uh, but the thing I want to mention about love, which is indirectly related, but I thought it's important for the audience. This is so deep because the unconditional love of a mother that she has for her children is really a kind of needy type of love because she needs to love because it completes her, right? An elevated type of love, if you do it 
via the love of Allah because He is the source of all love, right? And He is the greatest benefactor and He is Al Wudud, He is the loving, right? So I always say something like, How can you love anything without loving the source of love itself, right? <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that. But yeah, so that's the second. The, 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 yeah. In the Islamic context, we, we, might, we might not put it as. Um, that love is predicated on a needy love, even if there is a psychological truth in there. We would just simply say that love is a hub tabi'i. It's the natural love. You well, just can't true, help but love. Well, that's true, but the reason I, I, maybe I should unpack this more, the reason I mention this is because a mother loves because she needs to love. Allah, she does, it completes her, let's be honest. And it completes me as a father, right? Yeah, absolutely. But listen yeah. to this. Allah is of samad He is independent. Everything depends on Him. He is al ghani He is the completely, absolutely rich and free. Yet he loves. So Imagine problem. how pure his love is. That's the point I was trying to and make. That, and that's why we are here. Not, I mean, not talking about here. Uh, I'm talking about that's why we're here. Well, we're here as well. We're here as well. In this room because it's Allah's all, love. It's all about love. Third verse out of four. Okay, the fourth one is like every Muslim man knows the fourth verse. Okay, but the third verse, subhanAllah. Allah says about a particular type of mosque that is created and built by hypocrites for the wrong reason and for, uh, for causing schism. Um, in the Quranic vocabulary, it's called Masjid al-Dirar, the mosque of harm and, uh, and negativity. Then immediately after that verse, لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِي يَوْمْ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَقُومُ فِيهَا فِيهِ a, a mosque that is founded on, from day one on the foundations of piety is more deserving that you stand to pray in it. Fihi, and the verse continues, Fihi rijalun yuhibbuna ayyatataharu wallahu yuhibbul mutatahirin. Because in it are men who love to be purified and God loves those who are purified. In it are men who what? love to be purified, not just purification for wudu and then entering into the formal canonical prayer. Absolutely, that is purification. But purifying their hearts of everything other than Allah and displeasing Allah and the ego getting the better of it and the whims and desires overcoming it uh, such that we end up doing haram. That is the mark of a man and it's not me that's saying it, it is the book of Allah. This is... Um Quite moving. It's as if I've never heard this verse before. And and look at it. Here is a mosque you built know with the wrong reasons. This is the right reason, but why? You know what's Fihi really, rijal. And what's powerful here, this opens now the kind of the gate to discuss the kind of internal elements because Allah loves those who purify themselves. And there's the internal purification, right? So let's let's just hold that. Okay. Because uh, because I, I share with you the same sentiment. Th what you just touched on is the heart of the matter. But let me just do my last Rijal verse. Okay. Only if you promise that we talk about the four spiritual diseases and we need to <laughs> speak about these because it we'll connects with the third verse. Right. And absolutely. by the way, we need to talk about bravery and strength as well. It's all part just of the problem. Just in case we get accused of being like too softies. Part, part, part <laughs> of the problem. So, right. so far, all we've done really is look at three verses, yes. uh, which mention the word Rijal, men, just to get an idea and of what so Allah thinks. And there's so much there, we just scratched the surface. Absolutely. So here's the fourth one, which many Muslims know, and it can be quite abused. Uh, it certainly um, has been abused, but I'm going to say it nonetheless. Ar-Rijal, of course it's going to have the word Rijal, Ar-Rijal. قَوَّامُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ Allahu Akbar, okay. absolutely. بِمَا فَضَّ اللَّهُ بَعْدُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْدٍ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Men are قَوَّامُون over women. Men are, uh, are protectors of women by virtue of what strength Allah has given the one over the other and because of what they spend of their wealth to maintain them. Yes. So the relationship between a man and a woman from just this verse there are other verses and yes. what and hadiths but just from this verse is and especially in marriage uh, and in uh, and in being a father or an older brother uh, if you're the head of the family qawamun it's qawama it's a responsibility of protection it can be physical protection but it can also be psychological protection absolutely uh, quite often women need less physical protection 
than they do psychological protection. Sometimes we as husbands might be able to defend our wives physically and actually harm them emotionally. Absolutely. Right? That's true. But men are, main, are protectors of women. I cannot be, it's not permissible for me to, and generally, I mean, there's, there's some gradings of rulings here, but I, it's, permi it's not permissible for me as a Muslim husband to uh, physically beat my wife, okay? And just as I can't, as I can't physically uh, beat her, I can't, I can't uh, emotionally beat her. Yes. Men are maintainers, uh, are, are protectors of women because of the strength that Allah has placed in one over the other in general. Yes. There might be one or two kind of, you know, uh, uh, Olympic athlete women who are far stronger than whatever. But even then, in that context, he has a responsibility. Yeah, he's, he's still, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have to be absolutely. clear about this because and some even women the, sometimes say, oh, you know, I'm independent, I am educated, I can I have a job, that, I'm strong. That, and that's fine. If in marriage, a, a woman of that nature and, and a man has chosen to get married to a woman of that nature and that woman says, and therefore I absolve you of maintaining me, then that's her, she has wavered her right. But a man can't say, well, you're already a millionaire, I'm not going to spend on you. He has an obligation yes, to maintain. because the default is his responsibility. Absolutely. 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 But Absolutely. even if she absolves that right, right, she gives up that right. Part of your manliness. She, is that she still has to respect him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I oh, want to make that clear oh, 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 because absolutely. sometimes, like, oh, therefore he's he doesn't have authority. Absolutely, over me. of course he does. If he says something, you have you have to be devoutly obedient. So, so may Allah cause my words to be taken in their best way. Uh, they are the best of words from the Prophet's lesson, so, so. but the context can be abusive. Okay, uh, but you know we we can't fly from one extreme to the other. In that, it's been over mentioned and mis mis abused and misused, and now we don't mention it. But just on this thing, a, a woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hadith is saying it's well known, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hadn't seen her for a while. And he said to her, how are you? She said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm fine. Uh, and he, she said, uh, uh, he, he said, uh, uh, have you been, are you married yet? And she, in one narration, she said, Ya Rasulullah Sallam, yeah, I, I, I've got married recently. <coughs> uh, and he, he asked her, or she volunteers the information, I can't remember, uh, and he's a really good man. So the Prophet says to her, look towards him, for he is your paradise and hellfire. Yes. Okay. And maybe that was less, f not so much for her sake, but for all of us who come thereafter. That a husband has that maqam, that station in Islam, uh, that there needs to be uh, um, uh, honor and obedience in that which isn't disobedience and in that which is not unreasonable. Yes. There are some levels of obedience which are unreasonable. Wife is extremely tired and the husband says, you know, make a cup of tea now and let's just say they just, she just doesn't have the physical strength. That would be unreasonable. Otherwise, yeah, sure. obedience. Right? I mean, I think... Uh, How I think that is used and abused, I don't intend it to be abused. Uh, I've seen abused. some nice translations like righteous obedience, devoutly obedient. And, and the reason that's important because you're obeying your husband because you're obeying Allah, right? So that you're devout to Allah. Oh, you could, yeah, absolutely. And, you're, and you're, you have this righteous, devout obedience to your husband because you are devout to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the hope, which is yes. why, which is why, out of the qualities a uh, 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 man marries a woman for, religiousness hopefully would be the trump one. Because that which no, all the other qualities might not give you of that uh, godliness. Her religiousness will make her, you know, fear God and do right by her husband. And same with the husband. His religiousness and fear of God hopefully will make him do right by his wife. And so that they will both be loving and lovable spouses. Yeah, I, I loving find and that, lovable. you know, from experience and from just interacting with like lots of people, married and unmarried, you get a sense of that one of the most important things in marriage, like the oxygen of a man, is that he is respected, right? And that he is loved as well. And when that respect is gone, it can dismantle the whole marriage and the relationship. So and likewise, a man must respect and honor and love his wife and protect his wife emotionally and physically. But usually, sometimes we live in a culture where, and this is from what I see online and interacting with people, there is a sense of, because of this kind of post-modern, post-secular world that we live in, there is a sense of losing that maqam, losing that status of what it means to be a husband and a father, and that respect now, that oxygen is, 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 has been removed, and it destroys 
the essential hierarchy and it destroys the hierarchy of virtues in us in our community and society and this has to be taken extremely seriously Absolutely. And, and that's why you know I was in Dublin the other day and during the Q&A we I mentioned something about the hierarchy of virtues because and I want to be very clear here especially to the audience to the scholars the du'at in every every part of the world what's important is that we align our values and prioritize them in line with the Quran and what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told us and unfortunately in the past 10 years or so we had this discussion offline the past 10 years or so there's been this type of narrative that when we're talking about women and what it means to be a woman we don't talk about it in a way that's in line with the prioritization of values that Allah and His Messenger has given us sallallahu alaihi wasallam for example, and you see this unfortunately with some institutes or du'at or you know whoever they are, they push forward a narrative of what it means to be a woman, this empowered, liberated creature that's going to take over the world, that's going to make money, is going to be totally educated, and so on and so forth. Which, by the way, I'm not saying is a problem per se, but that has been a narrative, and there's been a huge kind of lacuna, a gap in the key priority or the hierarchy of values in our tradition which is the highest thing that a woman can be is a mother and a wife so I in will general say, i will say to you why that, why that, aren't we talking about this so uh, devil's advocate yeah like for example my wife no but devil's advocate highest, at this point she has the best role in the world like if she was a multimillionaire the best businesswoman and she was a whatever the case may be it would not be the same as what she is now. So she is a let, homemaker, she is a mother, she is a wife. So let me, let me stop you there. Yeah. Let me pull you up on I'm that. I'm passionate about this yeah, because no, it's so important. Because let the, me pull you up there. there. The, I get it. The I get cohesion it. of the Muslim family is so critical for our success. I get it. Yes. But let me pull you up on that. Please do so. Uh, and it's a devil's advocate uh, pull up. No problem. Okay. Which is this. Hold on a minute. Women are meant to be, uh, the best place the woman is to be a homemaker and uh, a child raiser or was, yes. like that. Ooh, okay. Now here my kind of modern sensibilities, like the kind of like, the, the alarm bells are going. Because didn't the lady Khadija, there wasn't she were an independent, successful businesswoman, you know, like she would have been a CEO of like in the city by now. How would you respond to that? Well, Please correct me, you're the sheikh here. So my understanding of that narrative was when she married the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she took a step back. Simple as that. And also took a step back um, from what, business, what, what? from the business life. He he took control sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also, you don't define what it means to be so a what, man. What did she do then? Well, it, well, well I, I'm I'm pleading the fifth here, but <laughs> this is irrelevant in my view to a certain degree because you don't define what it means to be a Muslim or a Muslim man or a Muslim woman with exceptions you just don't do that if you want exceptions you can find them in the tradition everywhere and this is so but this so is let the me, problem so let me add, but let I, me I, add I this make, no, no, this is the problem with that narrative and that's what's happening with some institutes and du'at and preachers is that they would take the exception because it's in line with postmodern liberal neoliberal secular sensitivities they would make it now the norm and this is the elephant in the room that we need to discuss. Yes, I agree, you could find an exception. Yes, in the contract in marriage, a woman could waiver her, her rights. She could be a multimillionaire. She could say, I'm going to take care of all the family. You don't need to work, oh husband. You could go, I don't know, uh, fulfill your footballing soccer dream or whatever. These exceptions exist, no problem. I'm not saying that. But, but I, when I, it comes to virtues and ethics and priorities, we, do the we can't use the exception. And I'm saying yes. here, there is no exception. I'm saying that you're perfectly right. Not only did she not propose to the Prophet ﷺ directly, as some yep. people think she did, yes. she did it via someone. Uh, not only did she, uh, she, even before she married the Prophet ﷺ, she wasn't going out and doing businesses. She, she had people to do it on her behalf, Absolutely. but it was her business yes, sure. in a male-dominated yes. society. Yes, yes. After marriage, uh, she just handed over, there more you or go. less, the, Took a step but back. more importantly, because she did that because there was something of greater attention and virtue that she she knew about Subhan. wifehood motherhood and slowly and steadily the quranic 
verses beginning to trickle down about Nisa Masturat. This is not a verse of the Quran, but this is a principle that women generally in Islam, I, I'm not making it up, okay, please go and check it up. You don't have to accept what I'm saying, okay? The audience doesn't have to accept. But go and ask the right questions. Generally, the, the feel and the flavor and the tenor of rev, uh, revealed verses or hadiths about women, am I, not, am I not right in saying that they are, they all verge towards masturat, not really being out there okay so their dress is more mastur yes. more kind of concealing than a man's dress yes uh, there in the case of the lady Khadija radiallahu anha okay she was mastur in that the seerah hardly mentions her now she is the first Muslim right she's the first Muslim yeah, but how is she mentioned one of the most powerful mentions and look how beautiful this this is she was the preserver of early Islam because when the Prophet وسلم, came down, no, she's yes. mentioned better than that, Hamza. Allah she's Allah. mentioned by the Prophet وسلم, saying, When no one believed in me, she believed in me and she comforted me. SubhanAllah. That's how she's mentioned. And also, and this is quite moving, when he mentioned her love, and I think it relates to Khadija, radiallahu anha, that her love nourished me. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's, it's moving. Isn't that beautiful? So the lady Khadija has unwittingly been butchered by us Muslims in the modern era. And the lady Aisha, I, uh, 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 I contend, has also been butchered by us Muslims unintentionally. You know why? Because we have, we have uh, adopted neoliberal and sometimes postmodern epistemological and metaphysical assumptions willingly and unwillingly we've jumped into the epistemological and metaphysical lizard hole thinking it's the cave of Hira yeah. <laughs> but we end up be we end up throwing ourselves into Jahannam so just but like the point about I Khadija Rajallahu Anna when he came down and he said cover me cover me look what she said look how she supported him and empowered him and th and this this shows how important it is to have a very deep meaningful relationship with your wife or wives and you see this in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I, I'm a true believer that a true sign of a man which is emulating the character of the Prophet Sallallahu is actually to have very deep meaningful relations with your, with your wife or wives. You know what Because else? he would love to spend time um, with them. Look at Umm Salama. No, Umm Salama that. had a, uh, the Prophet had a problem, right? Because of the treaty of, of Hudaybiyah, the Sahaba were like a bit reluctant to follow some stuff because they had a for the deen, they were a bit upset. The Prophet tells them to shave their head, they don't listen. The person goes and talks to Umm Salama radiallahu anha. What does she say? Shave your head. And roll, don't control. And roll people in your behavior. Be that which you want others to become. So he shaved his head, the Sahaba shaved the head. Advice from his beloved wife radiallahu anha. And so, so this, is, this is a very important when our, uh, when, our, when our scholars say that the texts speaking about women tend towards masturat, concealment generally, uh, the text about men speak about uh, concealing their dominance. So, in my house, my my wife, being a practicing sister and a, and, and a sheikh and whatever, mashallah, I mean, um, she gives me the entitlements that the Sharia gives me. Right? Okay. In terms of, in the end, I'm the head of the house, which is a bit of a dog's dinner because that means anything haram that comes in, I'm ultimately responsible, even if it comes by, <laughs> you know, dog's whatever, it's, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but the point being is, in Islam, even if the captain wears a, the captain's hat, he doesn't actually wear the hat. He actually does it through love, shura, consultation. Um Salama, the Prophet yeah, Salaam, this is consultation. 100%. It's only when you have an insecurity or when things are breaking up that you that the man ends up unfortunately egotistically asserting his yeah, manliness. I mean, man Otherwise, has to a say, man doesn't assert yeah, his manliness. When a man says, "I'm the man, respect me," I think that it's already a sign of, a, of, a, of either of a, a pathology in him or a breakdown in between them. Yeah, two. that 100 okay. percent. Uh, and just like in leadership, like if I say a CEO of Sapiens. I'm the boss, listen absolutely, to me. Plus, I'm already finished, yeah? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean 
that authority is not there from a no, Sharia absolutely, perspective. Absolutely. So the man sometimes would have to be positively assertive. And like my dad mentions this really well. He's not Muslim, but may Allah guide him. He mentions it as love and law. So it's like a box, right? You've got the boundaries, which is the law. And inside the box, tolerance, forbearance, love, compassion, uh, just like what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. So was your dad a, a, a Muslim? No, he's not Muslim. No, not Muslim. Mela got him. But he um, sounds like um, one, doesn't he? Yeah? yeah, because, you know... It's unbelievable. I, because what you I need have, to meet my dad, by the way. My, my, one of my teachers used exactly that in Arabic. He's about marriage. He said, marriage is love and law. He said, the law brings your boundary, but the actual marriage needs, needs to be based upon love. Yeah, for sure. And I truly believe that it takes a good man to help a woman become very good. And it takes a good woman Absolutely. to help a man become good. Absolutely. Because, because they, marriage... They, they complement each other. You know this other. kind of like, you know, cliche. Oh, I'm going to fulfill half of my deen, half of my faith. No, no, no. The reason you fill half of your faith, in my view, is not because all of a sudden you're going to feel complete and there's going to be angels coming, there's going to be fireworks. and No. It's because she's your mirror. She, she knows you better than maybe you know yourself or other people know you. And she would, she would get the best out of you or the worst out of you or she'll notice the best in you and empower you and or notice, notice the worst in you and remind you humbly in order for you to be on that journey so you could come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, I really believe marriage is a mirror. Whilst, whilst I remember this, um, one of my teachers said um, to me, um, this is years after I got married, um, he said it's important to understand that in Islam there are there are two things. Sometimes respect is earned. Yes. Okay, and that's in the world as well. Respect is earned. But there are occasions in Revelation in Islam where Allah says, respect this this person or the function of this person. Respect the head of state. Yes. By uh, virtue of the role, not by virtue of the person. Right. Respect the husband for yes. the same reason. Okay. So in those occasions and there are more than two occasions but there aren't many where we respect the role uh, and hopefully the person in it but respect the role then the principle is honored but if a woman is not respecting her husband because he is doing un-islamic things Allah does not take her to task that is completely understandable but she needs to know that in, as a rule of thumb, women need to honour their husbands, not just love their husbands, honour their husbands. Uh, and it's something where if you're brought up in a traditional way, the idea of honour, which is now no longer in society, yes. okay, um, even, in, even in our religious practice, we, love, we, we talk about loving the Prophet so but something higher than love is ihtiram, honouring, uh, venerating, uh, ex, uh, the Prophet ihtiram, tabjil, tawkir, ta'zimun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Most of Islam we teach, oh, we need to love the Prophet, we should love the Prophet, absolutely. But we never teach what is higher than that, which is ta'zimun Nabi, not just mahabbatin. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the husband. Uh, it's not just that they should be nice and loving and lovable and whatever, but actually the, uh, the Quranic, uh, uh, the hadiths talk about the woman honoring the husband uh, and the honor is slightly different than just kind of ordinary listening to and respect but but fair is fair no one teaches the concept of honor in society and so if someone in this generation okay you know a, a generation Z or even forget about generation even just after my generation okay my ch it's not taught so it's not on your radar how can it be on our radar in marriage if it's not even on our radar in religion with the Prophet SubhanAllah. So it's not necessarily anyone's fault, but yes. it's a lack of education. So, just to summarize the fourth verse here. Yeah, if you want to. We need to be protectors and maintainers of our women folk. Um, it's important that we, ha we ensure that our women folk are satisfied physically and emotionally. And that requires a kind of positively assertive attitude but also one that is compassionate and humble yeah and that you enroll people in your behavior so if you want love in your home you need to become loving because states of being give rise to states of being like if someone says there's no my wife doesn't love me okay when's the last time you loved her bro or you said you love her my husband doesn't love me okay when's the last time that you showed him love you want love at home be loving enroll don't control enroll people in your behavior so if you want humility be humble Humility gives birth to humility. If you want passion, be passionate. Passion gives birth to passion. If you want to be loving, 
if you want love, be loving, because love gives rise to love. And this is a very important perspective, especially when it comes to our brothers who have this sense of authority and that they have to take care of their family and women folk, that you need to be the transformation that you seek in others. This is so critical. It's a prophetic trait. He was so humble. He was compassionate. He was loving. He was brave. In the battle of Hunayn, when the arrows were flying, <coughs> the arrows, and he was marching forward, he said, I am the messenger of Allah, right? He is not a liar. And I think Abu Sufyan had to bring him back. He was so brave. Or we might, or we might recall, because that's a battle, and you think, oh, well, you know, ev- ev- many people can rise to the occasion. What about the, uh, the noise in Medina? Yeah, when absolutely. He was the first. Absolutely. He was the first. He's coming back when they're actually just getting absolutely. out to check out the noise. And he was absolutely. there ready to protect. No, no. And you know why? Because the, so it's interesting to talk about a sense of bravery here. Bravery is so neglected when it comes to leadership and what it means to be a male. We think bravery is just being strong and being able to fight, right? But bravery for me is a way of being. I call it become to overcome. It's a state of being. Don't focus on the action you need to do. Focus on who you must be. And the, in order to become brave, you need to be with the people around you who are brave. You can't find them. Reflect on stories of bravery. Reflect on the stories of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Secondly, un- have taqwa, have God consciousness, because at the end of the day, what is the worst that can happen, Sheikh? The worst that can happen is that you die. All right. And if you die, you did the right thing. Who are you meeting? Who is Allah? He is al wudud He is the intensely loving. He is al rahman the intensely merciful. You're going to meet a loving, merciful Lord. So the worst that can happen is that you're dead, okay? And when you die, what happens? SubhanAllah, eternal bliss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you understand what is the worst that can happen if I have to do the right thing and be brave, then it will make things much easier. Also understand the consequences of not being brave. And also understand that you have certain responsibilities. But the point here is when it comes to bravery, it doesn't mean you're never going to have fear, right? To reframe the whole, your whole way of being, you have to have an Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric mindset. And I truly believe if you focus on the worst <coughs> thing that can happen, the worst thing that can happen is that you die. Well, if you did the right thing, where are you going? So, and you that's know? important because sometimes we, we have this sense of dunya orientation. And sometimes we're reluctant to say the right thing and do the right thing. Don't get me wrong. We have to be wise. We don't want to make it difficult for ourselves. I completely get that. Hikmah is saying the right thing, doing the right thing, I at think, the right time, in the right place. If we, if we go but back do you get my bit, point? No, you're, no, all that you because said... Because the person's new. He knew. He's defending his people. But I think, we're sl- I think yeah. on, on this, I, I think we're possibly starting from somewhere... S- th- there's something more, f- more foundational, I feel, which is this. That, look... Um, even just on bravery, and remember that, 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 that we're, we're, we're just skirting around the point of By the way, this the is rijal. the intellectual bravery as well, right? Yeah, okay. no, the, uh, rija, uh, the, we're skirting around the fourth point that uh, there is a rajuliya, a, ma- a particular m- masculine way of interacting with the opposite gender. That's what we're talking about as a fourth point, yeah. and we're bringing bravery in. But my point being is this. Actually, my bravery point wasn't connected, but you can oh, okay. connect it, no problem. So, one of the things that Islam teaches us is um, really the, the, only, the only thing that counts is Allah. You know, when we say Allah Akbar and start the prayer, it doesn't just mean God is great. It means God is greater. Anything that you can think of, God is greater. And that includes our lives and our deeds. And one of the things that <coughs> our spiritual masters tell us, and you can see this in the great Imams, in, you know, Imam Ahmed comes immediately to mind, is that if fame was thrust upon them, notice the I notice the word thrust upon them as opposed to seeking yes, it. Yes. Um, the believer doesn't seek fame, but if it's thrust upon him, then um, he he or she then ask themselves what does Allah want from me and if it needs to be need be then they rise to the occasion no problem yes however bravery generally is in the ordinariness of everyday life okay we Muslims shouldn't be looking for those extraordinary moments to be brave they may never come we may never and we may never be called to do a legitimate jihad under a caliph for yeah, example, for sure. All right. but we should be ready to be brave in that way. No, 
Uh, yes, <laughs> that's a not. Like no. we have the right. But, but we should just. Conduct. But we should just be brave in our ordinariness by trying to overcome our egos, being in service to people, and actually being healers, not destroyers. People stepping out of the shadow into the light and helping others to step yeah, exactly. out. Yeah. That, is, right. that, is, that is bravery. Uh, that is a yeah, brave word. It's something that I mention a lot, which is the greatest enemy is the inner me. Yeah. So we have the, to, the greatest enemy is the inner me. But so I like that. Yeah, like so, that. so the sense of the nafs, the ego, the fitan of the qalb, of the heart, which are shahawat and shubuhat, blameworthy desires and destructive doubts. And you have the diseases, which, which now allows us to talk about this. I find it extremely problematic that a lot of our, us as a collective, we don't focus on the very essential internal elements of what it means to be a man, or even a Muslim, which includes battling one's ego, right? Yeah, you know, you may be able to articulate yourself well and push people around, but if you can't bench press your ego, <coughs> and if you can't basically swallow your pride, hold down your anger, then what kind of manliness do you have? You know, the amount of pettiness that I witness online is unbelievable. It's just a showcase so, of internal so that pathology. Be, so that would be yeah. a clear sign of unmanliness. 100%, 1000%. But I mentioned this a lot, but, but I want to be part of the solution. So the way to deal with this is to understand that the qalb, the heart, does taqallub, it wavers. Okay? Qalaba, it wavers. And the heart has certain spiritual diseases. I learned this from you, Sheikh. May Allah bless you and preserve you. Which you quoted Ibn Qayyum, may Allah have mercy on him, when he said the four major spiritual diseases of the heart are kibr, arrogance, ujub, self-amazement, riya, ostentation, and blameworthy jealousy, hasad. And remember, our actions, essentially, even our tongue, what we say, they're, they're spoons of the heart, like they dip into the heart and then what comes out is our actions and our tongue. So they're manifestations of our heart state, you know, our, our way of being. So if we have arrogance, rejecting the truth, thinking we're better than others. If we have ujub, we have self-amazement, it's all about me and I'm, a, I'm amazing and I have intrinsic value. Uh, it's not because of Allah, success wasn't from Allah, it was because of me. If I have real ostentation that I'm showing off, I'm showing off, I'm literally doing these deeds just for people to praise me. And there's another form of ostentation, which is sum'ah, which is basically you want people to hear about your deeds, not just witness them, but to hear about them. And you're doing the action in order for people to hear about it. And then you have blameworthy jealousy that, that you actually are jealous of someone to the degree that you don't want them to have it any, anymore. And you seek ways to remove it from them, whether it's in, uh, intellectual gifts <coughs> or whether it's other type of, of gifts that they have. <clears throat> so these spiritual diseases, all the other spiritual diseases manifest from them. Again, something that I learned from you directly. We hardly talk about these things. And I would even say it's probably more important than sometimes the action itself. Because the action itself <clears throat> is predicated on, contingent on our heart state. And one of the reasons of, for that is because we don't quite always link, or we haven't been taught to link, these inner spiritual growth with actually the concept of what it means to be a man. For whatever reason, we tend to divorce these essential obligatory aspects of religious learning and growth um, with the idea of learning to be a Muslim man. Let's focus on just Muslim men, even yeah, though sure, it applies to women. So, for example, if I were to open up a fairly large book on Muslim ethics and, um, and fatwa, male masculinity chivalry male yes, chivalry absolutely. one of the things we um, what i might come across and it will be unsurprising is that muslim men tend to not speak much <laughs> they tend to be more contemplative uh and say whatever they need to say uh, but they don't kind of just yap yap but today we men society as a whole men in society and we're part of society we yap yap a lot for whatever reasons okay and even if there's nothing haram but it's yap yap the distinctive virtue of a Muslim man that he, you could count how many words he's said, going back to the teachings of the Prophet oh, is okay. absent. Why is it absent? It's because there is something to do with the ego. I want to be heard. I need to be a part of the, uh, the conversation. And yet, the prophetic way, not, and again, in context of Muslim men, is that 
good deeds don't require a trumpet. There's no fanfare about it. And because Allahu Akbar, God is greater, the Muslim man prefers to learn to just sink back into obscurity, but always being responsible, never leaving a vacuum, doing what needs to be done or saying what needs to be said, mm -hmm. but then just it's out there and now it's khalas, this is for Allah and Allah is the one who's controlling. But what's happened today is, and it's been going on for a long time, is that we don't have that thing on uh, on wanting to be obscure, humuliya. It was a trait of men that generally they would do something and then not make a big fuss about okay, it. Okay, I want to just play. And that, sorry, th and the reason why is that comes down to is something in the ego. So the, it, we need to go back to what you're saying. There are Agreed. there is tarbiyah training of the heart that needs to be done. But Sheikh, the problem of the problem with this is the wrong type of people have not sat back and they've gone forward, and the right type of people have sat back. And I think this also links to the whole issue of fear this whole issue of even maybe intellectual spiritual you know, cowardice. I actually don't, I actually don't agree with I that. Live, I just want to finish the point. A lot of the brothers that have got involved in this sector to fill a gap is because maybe those who were qualified, and there may be an element of truth in this, haven't basically stood up and said, right, I'm going to fill this gap. So I, 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 the reason you get why the point I, I get it, I, and I've heard it for... Why, no, why I, do you disagree? I've heard it for... Um, you know, when I was growing up in, in terms of the like kind of a, a late 80s of re religious growth, okay, um, I used to think that, you know, if the scholars were doing their thing, we wouldn't be in this mess. I, I really believe that. But by the time you start learning the tradition and then you're interacting with scholars and then you're getting a sense of what's going on in the world, you realize that that's, I actually, you I came to realize that's so not true. So maybe it's because it's we myth. disrespected the scholars, maybe. Well, that's, that's a part of it. But it's where we choose to look and not to look. It's going back to that thing that I said in the beginning. Um, if, we choose, if we choose just to see the online world, we will find hardly any scholars, we will find a lot of nonsense, and we might not fo find many role models. Okay. But actually, in society, in Muslim communities, my, my personal Muslim community in, uh, in Redbridge, Ilford, for example, or even if I took where I was raised and brought, brought, uh, brought up uh, E11, E10, um, E4, E17, that kind of East London area, um, even when I go back there, I find many just ordinary role model men. But they're just ordinary role model men. Mm -mm. They got their jobs. So many of them are professional. Some of them are retired. Some of them are whatever. Sure. But they're... But where are they online? Well, actually, these particular men, um, they're of a particular age. They, at most, they might do Zoom and they might use, <laughs> they might use Facebook smoke for communication. Signals. Yeah, for smoke, smoke, smoke. Absolutely. Most code. <laughs> so if you want to find it, okay, and this is where I believe. This I is, think maybe... This is, sorry, this is yeah, where course, I believe, course, and it's for another conversation for another absolutely, time, absolutely. where Dawa culture has a lot to answer for, because what Dawa culture does is that it doesn't do what we thought we were trying to do in the beginning. Before I was a formal student of knowledge, I was a day, in the sense that, you know, you, you've got no learning, you've kind of not read the Qur'an or whatever, and you're just following Qur'an and Hadith. This is 83, 84, yes. you know, uh, and for about six, five or six years, or four or five years, three or four or five years, it was like that. However, even at that time, I was kind of clear in my heart, I thought I was clear in my heart, let's put it that way, I thought I was clear in my heart that, when the scholars are here, I can then shut up because we are just stepping stones. That's how it was meant to be. Of course, ego comes in the way, shaitan gets the better of you, and we become more than stepping stones. We actually become focal points, mm. even if scholars are there or not. That has amplified drastically, you know, beyond proportion today. You don't get da'is who, yes, you do get da'is who say, and I have many da'i friends, okay, uh, and I don't know any one of them who will not say something like, worse than the fact that I'm not a scholar and whatever. I think all of them, all of them know that they're not scholars. But what they won't do, and what we don't, don't do as students of knowledge, is say, you know what, hold on a minute. Let's just ask the sheikh. He's just down the road or he's just like one door away or he's just in the next room. It's still about us. It's still about us. And, 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 and the Islamic tradition is 
pass it to someone who you think knows. Yes. So what is the point of you and I honoring the Salaf and honoring narrations of the Salaf that say, oh, one of the Salaf, one of the great early Muslim scholars, Imams, was asked the question and he said, okay, ask that one. Yes. And then I went to ask that one and he said, ask that one, went to ask that one, and then it goes back to the first one. So, yeah. And, the po and I, I came across 120 of the, uh, the, the, the Ansar of the Prophet, the, the, the Sahab of the Prophet, and each of them begged not to answer but to put it to their brother to answer. Because why? The, the way of the awliya, the way of the Muslim man, as Allah wants it, is we don't shirk responsibilities, we don't leave vacuums where we can't, where we, you know, where we can fill them. But we try to just, just disappear into the background and seek the right people for the role. Absolutely. So, okay. So, in a Dawa context, that would mean that there should be more <coughs> of a connection with our scholars. We should do more shura with the scholars, and we should be mouthpieces for the scholars. I think Dawa. Uh, we should big, be mouthpieces it's, for the scholars. It's a big, because it's a a big topic. Is, yeah. But it's it's what you're. It's basically what you have been pushing out for, uh, mashallah, for for a while now. But that, that means, look, that means we need to be spiritually rooted. Agreed. But but that would also require as a practical manifestation of that that we actually <coughs> seek shura consultation with the right people who have ilm. But not necessarily only the scholars. Can I just say on well, on tarbiya and people of experience? <coughs> yeah. On, on tarbiya, so for example, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, and this is something which is just well known. It's not not well known about him, but well known about just He's uh, the famous how to humbly scholar uh, and the, the, probably the one of the greatest spiritual masters in Islam is, is certainly the most famous of the spiritual and masters and also misunderstood to a certain degree yeah um, yeah full of fabricated yes, uh, sure. uh, uh, stories about him anyway he's humbly so he learns his fiqh from humbly scholars and whatever whatever but he actually learns his suluk i mean he learns suluk from a particular humbly scholar but his actual main spiritual learning or suluk um uh, it's from Hamad al Dabas, who wasn't from the scholars. In so fact, he couldn't read. He couldn't read or write. He just knew his basic faraid and wajibat and sunnahs as an ordinary Muslim. But he was an extraordinary Muslim. This idea of when the Prophet ﷺ says that the best of you are those who, when you see them, remind you of God, is because in the Muslim society after the early age of Islam, you had um, scholars of t uh, you had masters of ta'lim of teaching the religious instruction, which we normally call scholars, and you had masters of tarbiya and spiritual training. Yes, Taskit nafs Taskit nafs And sometimes you found one scholar that was both, but normally it was different. So in Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah jama'ah, a small little circle of close students, he wasn't, he was the alim of ta'lim. He was the, he was the scholarly expert. There's no doubt about that. Okay, uh, Ibn al Qayyim first joins him when Ibn al Qayyim is only 20 or 21. Okay, Ibn Taymiyyah is up there. Who does he leave the spiritual instruction? Because he knows that he has to give them spiritual. And Ibn Taymiyyah is a spiritual man himself, absolutely, deeply. Absolutely. But who does he leave the spiritual to someone four years older than him in his group called Sheikh Ahmed ibn Ibrahim al Wasati? He is the Imam of Suluq. Uh, f for the Ahlul Hadith, Hanbali, Athi, renun uh, renunciants of that time, but particularly for Ibn Taymiyyah's wow, Jama'ah. Wow. So they are getting their fiqh and their fatwas from the Shaykh, and they could, and, and whilst uh, 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 Al Wasti was alive, they were getting their suluk from him. So to summarize this point. Uh, sorry, and the point I'm trying to make is yeah. s even practicing Muslims today, we think the, sh the scholar. Mufti, Sheikh, Alim, who's teaching you usul al fiqh and whatever, is going to be the sh suluk, uh, uh, the Sheikh of Suluk. It's unlikely he Agreed. is. Not so, impossible, but unlikely. So therefore, from a Dawa context, you, the brothers need to be around people who are scholarly scholars, and then to be connected with a good circle of what's the right word? Mentors, spiritual mentors, if you want to use that term from a kind of modern or just do what Allah says in the Quran wa kunu ma be with the righteous yes. truthful ones which means having suhba compa spiritual companionship with spiritual people agreed that is lacking I know this from so, sorely and severely oh my god of course it's a lacuna it's a gap but let Allah me has put people out there they exist and that's yeah. why we need to remind our brothers and myself and each other that we need to revive that because a lot of the mistakes that happen in the Dawah 
could have been prevented if we had righteous people around us, internally and externally righteous, and we were connected to the scholars and we were humble enough to do extensive shura and listen to that consultation. And I find when you move away from that, we end up having these mistakes. And this connects back to the whole spiritual diseases of the heart, ujub, riya, kibr, and hasad, that the things like not forgiving our brothers, always trying to defend ourselves for petty matters, not overlooking um, people's faults, picking on people's faults, not having hilm and forbearance, which is, a, which is a key characteristic of the Prophet ﷺ, not repelling by that which is better, which is the key characteristic of the Prophet ﷺ, which is connected to da'wah, by the way, because in Surah Fusilat, verse 33, Allah says, and who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah, Tawheed is worthy of worship, the only deity worthy of worship, that, that they're righteous, they do righteous deeds, and they say, I'm one of the Muslims, which can also mean, I'm just a Muslim, I'm humble. I, I, just because I'm doing this doesn't mean I'm special, right? Then the next verse, which is connected to this holistic approach of calling to Allah, is one of my favorite verses. I always repeat this verse, good and evil are not the same, repel by that which is better. Between two people, if there's any enmity, it will turn to intimate friendship. And this is very difficult, except for the patient. Interestingly, the Arabic word for repel is not followed by a direct object. In this context, Allah doesn't say repel evil, repel anything by that which is better. And the ulama, the scholars say, repelling by that which is better is repelling by that which is more virtuous and more beautiful, which can include also being assertive in certain con depending on what the context is. We don't have that sense of hilm and forbearance. Why? Because we're not connected to the scholars. We don't do shura. We don't have the humility to learn from them and even take them seriously. And if we do shura, it's done for a tick box exercise. And also we don't have the right righteous people around us. And we're not working on the spiritual diseases of the heart. So it's I, easy so to be to muscular and, so and, is and that, aggressive. Is that, whim, is that women's fault? Or is, because we're talking about men. When men don't do all that you said, is that women's fault or is that the men's fault? All that you said, we don't do this, we don't, quite rightly. So can I therefore I, blame women for me not doing that? No, or is it no, my own fault so. as a man? No, no, we have our own responsibility. Right. So that's a shortcoming with so us when men. I However, good women get the best out of their men. Okay. And good men get the best out of their women. Because supposing, it's, it's, supposing a complement, my, it's a supposing, complementarian... Supposing my wife... Take my wife, take my no, wife, supposing my wife, no, you could pick my uh, wife Supposing well. my wife did not <laughs> get the best out of me, but she didn't bring the worst out of me. But supposing. She, she tried. Is she, look, no, is supposing she, she didn't try even. Supposing I just want to make a point of yeah, principle. Yeah, it's, it's, it's default is the man's responsibility. Right. But but on that point, yeah. two hadith, because I've given four verses, and yes, the last one was... Because we need to end the wrap-up. Yeah, last one was about uh, men are uh, protectors of women. Before you do that, because it links to the special diseases, I'm going to bring you back again, please, to talk specifically about the diseases and how to solve them. But you gave the solution, and I remember you taught me this again, Jazakallah Sheikh, that one of the key pieces of advice that the ulama, the, the scholars of tasawwuf, the scholars of tasqit nafs purification of the heart, and so on and so forth, they said the number one thing you should do to help with your purification of your heart, the ujub, the kibr, the hasad, the riya, is to have good companions. Is to have companionship, righteous companionship which you know you know you could do an inference based on Ibn Kathir's work well it's not even an inference it's direct when he talked about why did Allah mention the dog in the people of the cave right you don't remind me if you remove the dog from the people of the cave the story still makes sense on a prime facey point of view so on the face of it nothing really changes hello if you scratch the surface you see that what is Allah trying to say to us here the dog happened to be with the pious people and Allah saved the people in the cave and saved the dog so Ibn Kathir says, if Allah will save a dog because it happens to be righteous people, what would Allah do to your life? Allah <laughs> Akbar. See? You do learn something from me, right? No, I, I always it's learn something process. from you. It's two-way process. No, I'm no, only kidding. Honestly, I'm only kidding. So, but, but, the point is, your, your <laughs> teaching that you taught me that the number one piece of advice to have good people around you is the most fundamental so piece not of good advice. So, not good people. Visit good companionship yes it, it might not be that we can have it around us but we need to go and yeah we have sit to search yeah we have yes. to search for them we have to search so for them. two hadith about yes. uh, linking just to uh men are men are um, uh, protectors of women because of their spending because yes of their yes, yes yes the prophet says and That's it's something. a famous hadith uh, خيركم خيركم لنسائهم, the best of you are those who are best to their women folk. So actually mark of a Muslim man is how he treats his wives, his daughters, his sisters, his mothers. Okay, uh, and we don't own our wives. Allah owns our wives and Allah owns us. Yes. 
uh, this idea that oh my wife just has is being created just to, uh, just to do my bidding is not quite what the Sunnah teaches, but we've discussed some of that before. And lastly, it uh, the Hadith. Uh, again, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's well known, but I, it used to be well known. So Anjasha is someone who sometimes used to drive the camels and um, carry, you know, like a taxi service, okay, uh, normally for battles and whatever. And so one day Anjasha is, is carrying some of the uh, female Sahabas and the Prophet so and they've come back from a battle and, uh, you know, he's in a hurry to get home because there is something that... And so he's like really driving the camels fast. And the Prophet Sassam says, Ya Anjasha, slow down because you're carrying qawarir, fragile vessels. Mm. So the Prophet Sassam is not saying in this hadith that all women are just very weak and whatever. Yes, yes. What he's saying is that the ones that you're carrying, okay, are going to feel very uncomfortable at the speed that you're making these sure. uh, uh, camels thing, you know, this is like, you know, like a, a, a warrior on a horseback, you're, but you're carrying a caravan of people. Yes. Meaning, be aware of women in your boundaries and behave accordingly. Well, this is a, a well-known aspect of the Prophet Sam in the teaching that when we love for, for our brother, we love for ourselves, we love for humanity, what we love for ourselves, which is another uh, 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 narration. This means, and, and now we speaks about this, generally it means that we are committed to the well-being of others. You, we need to be committed to the goodness and guidance of all people, humanity. And it, imagine when it comes to your brothers and sisters, imagine when it comes to your women folk, you need to be committed to their welfare and to the goodness and the guidance. This is the key characteristic of the Prophet But, but um, my point was slightly, slightly different, which is okay, sure. not that you're wrong, absolutely. Uh, absolutely spot on. My point was that the believing man, the, 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 the Rajul Rijal, they are, on the one hand I said that we try to do what is right and disappear in the background, but on the other hand it doesn't mean we're not aware of the circumstances. So Anjasha was just being made aware that you have fragile sure, vessels. Sure. So in our treatment of women, so for example, there are, um, oh, since the early 90s, I, I've had female students. Yes. Uh, and in the last 10, uh, 10, 12 years, I've not taught female students much, unless it's a, uh, you know, a, a mixed class, an open yes. class. Uh, but I remember that when there, when I had female students, there will be times where you'd see one or two of uh, of, of the sisters really shine out in the, out of the rest of the class. When someone would ask me about, you know, the Muslim woman in hijab and how should she be towards her wife and this, that, and the other and whatever, whatever, I'd either ask them to ask my wife, which is what I still do even today. Uh, uh, but, but at that time also, I would ask, you know what? Uh, speak to this particular uh, sister, um, student of knowledge sister, because it's not that women, I'm not allowed to speak about hijab or this or that sure. or how women should be. I have every right to speak about how women should be in Islam as women have the right to speak about how men have to be in Islam. Sure. It's just that human nature is, there are some things that are so sensitive, it might be easier if women hear it from women. Yeah, for sure. Well, that makes and sense. what happens online, I notice that men are not only insensitive, not all men, okay, but uh, so much insensitivity, there's also a lot of this. There is, but... And I actually, I can actually do that to most of those young men on social media. Agreed, 100%. The, the door swings both ways, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You point the finger, three, absolutely. three fingers yeah, are pointing point back, you. yeah? But I think it's because there has been, and we can't talk about this now another time, but there has been an adoption, whether it's explicit or implicit, knowing or unknowing, an adoption of a kind of postmodern discourse and a feminist discourse amongst some of our sisters. The reasons for that we can unpack another time. And I think a reaction to that has been this kind of overreaction or unjust reaction and forgetting the kind of Allah-centric, Akhira-centric question we need to ask is what does Allah want me to do and react in this context that's more pleasing to Him, which would be a little bit more balanced. But we have to also appreciate that that discourse is occurring in our communities. Uh, no doubt. Which is no an doubt. alien discourse. It's a 
Kufri discourse, we have to do this again. I think this is one of the most uh, amazing conversations I've had. Allah bless you. Allah bless you. But I want to mention something about the liberal folk out there, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, and the postmodern folk out there that are Muslim or non-Muslim. Um, How about turning to the camera? Yeah, we don't apologize to you in any shape or form. This is the truth. It's come from an intellectual and spiritual foundation that is true, and we can articulate that. Uh, and in another time at another time and I just want to make it very clear that if you find this problematic or it's not in line with your liberal or postmodern sensitivities then you have the problem not us and you know this whole idea of that Islam has to now align itself with these liberal or secular or postmodern tendencies is a false narrative I tell you why because you're assuming that you've got something that's ideal uh, you have to understand that these ideas ideologies that have permeated you know, the Western Hemisphere, even the Eastern Hemisphere, have basically resulted in not understanding what a male and a female is, not, not preserving the family, not preserving morals and virtue. And also, it has actually contributed to social fragmentation and decay and communal disharmony and internal strife from a kind of spiritual perspective and a psychodynamic perspective and a psychosocial perspective. So before you want to point the finger and say, look, what are these medieval folk talking about? They need to be like us. With all due respect, what do you have? Think about what you have. And when you are humble enough to understand that it's a mess, then you'll be able to, be able to listen to us in a more kind of uh, uh, humble way to understand there is some, something virtuous in terms of the work, what we have to offer. I wanted to or, mention or, that because it's very important. Because or in, a, or in other words, uh, what we might be saying is... Um, just keep your mind open and one day maybe we can dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I'm coming across, you know, he's disarming me in a very beautiful way. Look, stand in the possibility that what we're saying is true. Stand in the possibility that it comes from the divine reality. And once you stand in that possibility and your heart is free from kind of previous intellectual, social and cultural baggage and you see it for what it is, then there may be some awakening. Sheikh, so, so, yeah. wallahi. I love you for the sake of Allah, and so does my nafs. Jazakallah for all your time. I want to do this again. Allah bless you. Allah bless you. Ustad, it's been a pleasure. Barakallah fikum. May Allah bless you. May Allah increase you in tawfiq. Wa alaikum as-salam. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.